Dusty watched as the ground fell, piece by piece, into a great gaping sinkhole caused by the alien energy. Far, far in the distance, the alien had collapsed to the ground as the woman extended her hand towards the sinkhole. It continued expanding, sucking in houses and tearing open power lines. He tossed and turned, unable to sleep. Not crazy. I'm not crazy. This proved it. I'm I'm not. I'm not. It's it's all real. It has to be. He jolted out of bed and peered into the blinds. A car, a white SUV, had stopped at the mailbox. He grabbed his gun. He realized that they were beating my voice into his mind. They had to have been. They were... They were using him. They wanted him to publish the video, didn't they? It was all going according to plan. The voice froze. He was catching on, wasn't he? He understood. There. Shut the fuck up! Jimmy Vilgiotti presents Rivers of the Mind Season 2.5, starring Colin Estes as Dusty and Adam Haverford, Michelle Pearl as Young Dusty, Jimmy Vilgiotti as the narrator and Young Dusty, and Sophia Doss as Aunt Amelia. And now, Rivers of the Mind, Season 2.5, Episode 4, How Dusty Put the Gun Down. You're getting there, boy, Dusty's father said, patting his son on the back. His son's ears rang. His shoulders ached. Here, here, hold it a little tighter, like this. Concentrate on the front sight, right there, on the tip of the barrel. You want to get lined up with the middle of the target. I don't know if I can do it, Papa. Sure you can, son. Heck, God says you're going to be a hell of a marksman. He does? Yeah, he showed me last night. You, you know, son, some bad people are coming here. You're going to, you're going to have to help me fight them off. I can't always be there to protect you. Straightening up his back, Dusty lined up the middle of the front sight with the chest of a sheet of paper shaped like an adult man. He tried to ignore the weight of the heavy gun. He shut his eyes and he tried to imagine them coming onto the property so he could work up the strength he'd need to kill them. The tall, sinister-looking government soldiers that his father told him about. Though his hands shook with fear, he stopped them. Couldn't show the enemy your weak spots, his dad always said. <laughs> Dusty pulled the trigger. His ears rang. Again, his vision blurred. He didn't notice his father applauding him for four or five seconds. But when he came back to his senses, he realized that he'd hit the target right in its heart. His father lifted him up and hugged him. It felt like the best day of his life. The thought came to Dusty before he could pull the trigger and shoot me. Came to him alongside. A more fresh image. His dad as he was now. Which he could see clear as day in his mind. He had shrunk. He had grown pale. His face had gone from smiling to sullen, his green eyes from beaming at him to staring at him morosely from the other side of a plexiglass barrier, reduced from the tall, heroic, confident man who taught him to shoot, a man who heard God speaking loud as a megaphone in his head, the man Dusty remembered from his infancy. Dusty knew that he couldn't let them 
do to him what they had done to his father. Dusty lowered his gun. His father didn't just teach him how to shoot. He taught him when. On the eve of his sixth birthday, God told his daddy that Dusty was ready for his own gun. That's what daddy said. Dusty recalled waking up on the plywood floor of the shed his dad had bought on one of his trips into town. The book his daddy read him as he went to sleep, The Three Little Pigs, rested next to his pillow. The sun peeked in through the blinds, and Papa was already up. You could hear the fire outside crackling. The smell of fresh-killed bacon hung in the air and drifted towards your nose. Papa shot a wild pig the other day, you remember, and he went into town for a few hours to buy ice to put it on. Excited, Dusty remembered throwing off a blanket. He remembered shaking a spider out of his shoes before heading outside and fumbling over the ground. His dad crouched by the fire, nursing the coals with a hot poker, their dog, a big old pit bull named Kung Pao barked at Dusty and ran at him before reaching the end of the chain. Dusty patted him on the head and he crept forward. His dad smiled. A big, goofy smile the kind Dusty almost never saw on him. Only when Dusty remembered that smile on his pa's face could he see in retrospect that something had been troubling his father. That, at that moment, There were just a few precious weeks left with him. Morning, Papa. Morning, Dusty. How'd you sleep? I slept good. I had a dream about three pigs. Oh, did you? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you write it down. Never know when you'll need it. I will. He flipped the sizzling bacon over and he set the spatula back beside the fire. The dog ran to him, sniffing ecstatically at the meat and pulling on the chain. Your birthday's today, son. You know that? No. Well, it's March 18th, the day you were born. Dusty had wondered why his dad would be up so early making bacon, not tending to his garden or writing in his journal. But now it all made sense. It was a special day. What are we going to do today, Papa? He wondered aloud. Whatever you want to do, buddy. Your choice. What would he do for this special day? The only other day they would get like this in the whole year was Christmas. He needed to pick something real fun. Can we go to the supermarket? Papa smirked at the suggestion, shutting his eyes in what Dusty now remembered as faintly amused exasperation. Papa didn't usually like to go to the supermarket, but he knew that Dusty loved it there. He loved the rows of colorful boxes and and bottles and fabrics the gleaming tiles and tall, imposing shelves, the rattling push carts that his dad would let him stand in. Sure we can. I gotta test drive the truck anyhow. You know what happens on birthdays, don't you? What? Birthdays, you get presents. Not the kind of presents you get on Christmas, either. The kind of presents that tell you you've earned something, gotten older. A little closer to being a man, you understand? That's what happens. So I got something to give you as soon as What are you going to give me? Well, as soon as we finish breakfast and wash our dishes, I'll show you. Dusty's dad slipped the bacon from off the frying pan onto a styrofoam plate for the two of them to share. Sit, Kung Pao. Oh, good boy. There you go, bacon. The dog leapt up into the air as the meat flew towards its mouth. Papa? Yeah? I was five yesterday. Does that mean I'm... Uh... I'm six today? Yes, it does. Someone's remembering their numbers. Is six... Is six a good number? Well... Well, sure it is. It's, uh... One step closer to one of the best numbers, seven. And you can... Well, if you divide your birthday by your birth month, you get six, so it's... It's uh, six shots in a revolver. I'd say it's a good number. Dusty, unsure what to say, nodded and he quietly tried to eat some of the bacon. You like it? Uh Uh-huh. Thank you, Papa. Dusty reached for another piece before finished chewing. And the two of them sat there talking. Dusty couldn't remember what about. 
as much as he wanted to remember, as much as he wanted the memory to anchor him into sanity as he stood there by his window, clutching the gun in his hand, hearing my voice echo through his mind as the car he had held responsible for the voice inside of his head drove away. It was only the next part he remembered clear enough. When they finished dunking the plate in bleach water and hanging it up on a clothesline, his father hugged him tight by his side and said, Now you just wait here a second. I gotta go get your present. He strode off. Dusty remembered Kung Pao sitting next to him, longingly staring up at the tabletop and drooling. He stroked Kung Pao's ears and the dog nuzzled into him, licking his face. His dad set something down on the table. Something long and heavy, wrapped in newspaper. Well, go ahead, open it. Tearing cautiously at the wrapping material so that they could eventually return it to the shipping container at the edge of the property. Since, after all, his father always said, only a fool rips perfectly good newspaper. Dusty unfurled the wrapping into a nest that cradled a huge black rifle. Dusty's mouth opened and he started jumping for joy. Now listen, you gotta remember, this ain't a toy. You're getting this because you're ready to get it, understand? You're growing up, and it's time for you to get this gun, but you need to act responsibly. Sure, Papa. You gotta understand that this thing can kill people, alright? You don't point this at anybody, anybody, that you aren't a hundred percent sure is posing a threat to you. Is that clear? Clear as day, Papa. God don't like it when people kill each other. When people kill each other, it makes him angry. But it ain't just God you gotta worry about. You take a human life, you have to carry that every minute till the day you die. You gotta think about the consequences of your actions and be ready to take the full responsibility. I will, Papa. Promise. Good. Dusty slid his gun back into the nightstand and he sat by the bed, looking down the hallway towards his computer. What was he thinking? He knew what had happened to his father, and he knew that they would distort everything. Everything. If he stepped out of line, there was no doubt that they would try to make him look as insane as possible. He knew that. The news reports didn't mention how kind or humble or loving his father was, only that he had left behind a six-year-old boy on a plot of land littered with sheds and shipping containers and makeshift gardens. A plot of land overgrown with forest. And they didn't mention how his father had taught Dusty to read and write or do arithmetic three grades ahead of his age level. Only that when social services found the six-year-old boy, he was malnourished. He was sleeping in the bottom of a tiny shed, crawling with spiders and cockroaches. He was pointing a rifle at the social worker who'd come to take him into foster care. In the news stories, his father was a monster. But Dusty knew the truth. His father wouldn't have killed those people if he wasn't a hundred percent sure that they posed a threat to him. And Dusty also knew that if he killed someone, the media would make him out to be a nut job, just like they had with his dad. After all, Dusty has a, enough weapons to arm himself and all of his neighbors against a flotilla of New World Order paratroopers. He has enough food saved up to last two years. And, of course, all of his measures to keep himself safe, he was certain, could be twisted into some kind of spectacle for the public eye. What made the story of Dusty's father especially spectacular for the press was how he had come across the sprawling plot of overgrown land outside of Dallas. After all, he did not come from a marginal family of degenerates, but he was an heir to the Haverford Catheter fortune. 
He had studied at Ivy League schools and published research as a respected psychiatrist until he disappeared from the public eye in 1965. What Dusty knew, and what no one else believed, was that his father had been drugged while enjoying a drink at a bar in Austin, that he'd been taken to an underground laboratory in the hill country where the government performed mind control experiments on him. Though eventually released, his father never recovered from his captivity and struggled to maintain a private practice. He got fired from three teaching positions and became a pariah in the field of psychiatry. Work at his family's catheter company never panned out either. His years of experience as a catheter salesman brought him little joy or fulfillment. Eventually, he purchased his land and began to build the compound. His wife, Dusty's mother, left him there in 1981 with an unfinished brick shack and a barely weaned baby. She flew to Toronto and she hung herself in a hotel room a few days after. Dusty's father always said that it was because she knew the truth. She couldn't quite handle it. Dusty's abandonment seemed to provide a moral lesson, or at least a cautionary tale for the wealthy around Dallas about the perils of insanity permeating their ranks. But only a few knew the name of the little boy discovered on the plot of land. They only knew his Aunt Amelia, whose generous work taking in the Haverford boy, as he was called, was ever lauded in the elite social spheres of northern Texas. Aunt Amelia, who later repossessed Dusty's father's land to build a golf course, came from another wealthy family. Her grandfather owned a company that had produced mandolin family instruments during the height of the mandolin orchestra craze in the 1910s and 20s, and her mother had pioneered and even gained renown for a new method of continuous curvilinear capsularexis for ophthalmic surgery. Her and her husband used their money prodigiously to grow their fortune even further, purchasing or investing in, among other things, a company in West Texas that lets you hunt pigs from a helicopter with a machine gun for $1,200 a person. A Vietnamese sandal manufacturer. And a strip mall in Baton Rouge. Louisiana. But of course, Aunt Amelia did not just care about making money. She cared about making a difference in the world. And it didn't hurt that making that difference in the world might help her sister Kathy shut right the hell up about the goddamn orphanage her stupid husband paid for every Thanksgiving. <sighs> Kathy donated a thousand dollars to research breast cancer? Well... Amelia donated 2000 just to show her punk ass up. Kathy helped her alma mater build a new library. Well, Amelia's old school could probably expect a nice check for some kind of fancy science machine in the mail one week later. Kathy had an orphanage in some third world country. Well, Aunt Amelia was caring for the children in need in the United States of America, unlike Kathy and her borderline socialist husband. Dusty remembered when he met Aunt Amelia. She smelled intensely of flowers and shampoo. Who are you? I'm your Aunt Amelia. Don't worry. You're with me now. Get away from hey, me! Hey! Ma'am, please, don't take it too personally, okay? 
he will warm up to you. The prophecy of Dusty warming up to Aunt Amelia failed to materialize. Aunt Amelia expected that a small taste of civilized life would be enough to break down Dusty's walls in an instant. And when that did not work, she hoped that eventually he'd at least see her as as family. But what she saw as a palatial, luxurious house seemed like a sprawling, confusing, and stuffy maze to Dusty. The mattress in his room was so soft he couldn't fall asleep. No matter what she tried, he only wanted to sleep on the ground. Politeness and pleasant conversation were lost on the Haverford boy as well. And Amelia quickly learned that letting Dusty sit at the table during an elegant gathering would never end well since he would always prop himself uncomfortably onto the table by his elbows. He would chew with his mouth agape. He would never look at anyone who tried to speak to him, and would sometimes eat right from the plate in the middle of the table instead of trying to fill up his own. And when they sent him to his room, Dusty didn't like to play with any of the toys that she had bought him. He only wanted to play with guns. Something Amelia felt was a bad idea for someone with his family history. Dusty relived it all in a half-sleeping haze as the sun creaked up over the horizon. He sobbed, though remaining not fully conscious of the tears coming from his eyes. The gun in the nightstand, loomed in the room like a monster, an invisible demon. All through the house he could feel the presence of Aunt Amelia. She bought the land on the highway that he lived on now. She'd bankrolled the work he'd done investigating the truth behind his father's crimes. She'd stocked his cupboards with mugs from the Haverford Catheter Company, and commemorative plates from her failed business ventures. And he wasn't sure if his eyes were open, or if they were closed anymore. He could not move his body. Something pressed down on him. A man stood in the morning light right above him. A fishing pole dangling from his left hand. Dusty could not move to escape him, to move from him. He quickly fell back to sleep and woke up in Aunt Amelia's house, where his aunt would try to treat him like a son she cared for, but She could never stop looking at him like he was a monster that she had to placate. He drifted back to his room where he slept on the carpet, remembering, remembering in fear that he would forget, that he would accept Aunt Amelia's futile offers of toys and nice meals and private school tuition and give up on looking for the truth. He would sleep there remembering and remembering that morning his father had shown him how to shoot. The morning he had given him his gun. The afternoon that followed at the supermarket. They pulled up to the supermarket in a beat-up pickup truck. Before they left, they'd each taken turns washing off in the creek. Dusty's dad hoisted him up into the cart, and he let out a cheer for joy, which made a few people turn their heads to stare. And his father smiled at him 
He didn't say a word. He only pushed the cart forward, his dirt-stained hands guiding it along, his beaming eyes and his smile masking what Dusty now understood a little better, to be the tortured soul of someone who knew the truth, of someone burdened with the ever-present, ever-louder voice of God. Hello folks, and thank you for listening to Rivers of the Mind. We're grateful that you took the time to listen to our show. Rivers of the Mind is written and produced by me, Timmy Vilgiotti, and it features Colin Estes as Dusty and Dr. Adam Haverford, Michelle Pearl as Young Dusty, Sophia Doss as Aunt Amelia, and myself as the narrator and the social worker. If you like Rivers of the Mind, or if you hate Rivers of the Mind, or if you just feel ambivalent about Rivers of the Mind, I invite you to leave a review on whatever website you're listening to this through, and to share it with your friends, your enemies, and your co-workers. I'm producing this episode on July 15th, and it should be released while I am just about to head back from Brazil. Anything you can pledge to the show through our Patreon would be immensely helpful. Just go to patreon.com slash timmyvilgiotti, that's spelled V-I-L-G-I-A-T-E. That's all I gotta say, folks and I hope you have a great day.